everybody. Welcome to the Earthborn Games Podcast. I'm your host, Andres Carlson. It's good to be back with you all. I'm sitting here with Andrew Navarro. Oh, let me just first say, this is what it should be done. We're missing Evan Simonette tonight, but we do have Andrew Navarro here. We're going to you Hi. first for the first time ever. Yeah, I think it might be, the first, <laughs> except for maybe the time we did a podcast or it was just the two of us. That was a nice. You might a, be right. That's right. Yeah. How you doing, Anders? I'm doing good. I've had a real busy day. Um, let's see how my energy, you know, maintains throughout this. I, I, I'm feeling optimistic. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, your hair looks great. Thank you. Yeah, You've does. got great energy. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I'm I'm very optimistic for uh, for this podcast. Uh, well, uh, we can tell them I was I, I got the time wrong or something went wrong and I'm just an hour late. <laughs> Well, this we were scheduled because everything's crazy because we're on a Monday instead of a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we haven't we've been scheduled we've been recording during the day, so there's been no consistency and mm -hmm. we were at you know, PAX. Yeah, yeah so, so you know it, it's I sent you know we sent a calendar invite, but you don't look at your calendar, so it's, you guys. How would you know that was my fault? How would you know that I ignore calendars? <laughs> Part of my syndrome. Um, <laughs> But as a result, we get this amazing energy you're bringing right now. So everything's, everything's good. It's all good. I'm glad uh, to be here. Um, and then we've got Andrew Fisher. Hi, Andrew. Yeah. Hi. I, I I I don't have any prepared topics to talk to you about today. I, Shame on you. I know. I, I don't have my mandatory start of podcast banter prepared. Yeah. Yeah, nothing. Nothing going hey, on. Andrew and I had all this time waiting for you, and I didn't even yeah. think of anything. Yeah, we bantered for about Would half an hour about? while we were waiting for you to I show up. I expended all my banter. We talked about the Packers a bunch. Uh, okay, right. <laughs> we did. Yeah, talked a lot of football. Yeah, yeah. we were just talking. I, I chimed in a little bit about the the unnecessary nature of the kicker in football. And I tend to believe that. I saw like a rant that Larry David was doing about that, and I was like, yes, kickers suck. <laughs> wow uh, coming in hot here i like kickers yeah I'm, I, I, I enjoy the i enjoy the kicking game yeah and some of them are the most like enduring personalities in in, mm. in the sport so i i'm i'm into it you're into it yeah it's epic it's epic like moments of... for kickers either fa you're failing or succeeding yeah. there's some amazing kicking moments that are just i, I feel like right, it's a right. slightly thankless job right oh, now that now that they've increased the distance, I, I think like a little more value is placed on it. But for a while, mm -hmm. it was basically assumed that you'd make it, and if you ever failed, yeah. shame on you, right? Like, right. Well, that's just the point after touchdown. Like, that's you, true. you're still like that. You know, these guys kick it like you know some of them like sixty yards. Yeah, when you're through, when, you get, when you're going for like the the crazy last minute field goal or something, yeah, yeah, that that moment to where try they to tie it up, yeah, that moment where the kick comes off the foot and it's going, and then you know you see if it's like you, you just you see it going right down the middle, like that that feeling of of joy and exhalation you have at that at that moment is pretty awesome. Or yeah. conversely, if it veers left or right and misses or falls short, it's just mm -hmm. oh man, crushing. Right, it's good. It's so good. Right. Okay. Emotions. You, you, I'm torn you, re now. You, re mm -hmm. you recount that moment though, but like a lot of what I'm always thinking when the kick is going towards the end, end zone is like, I can't tell depth wise where this ball is. Like as soon yeah. as it goes in the air, and I'm just sitting there like, is it is it close to the end zone? Is it far away? I yeah, like, yeah. I, I, I pay for HD TV, and I still can't tell where that <laughs> where it is. They need a ball uh. cam. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that'd be still my gosh. I mean, that'd be impossible I, to watch. Bring back, bring back 3D TV so I can tell where the ball is in depth. Oh yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Larry, Larry David was saying that you know it's ridiculous that the whole game is you know hanging on this one guy who's not even playing the game up until that moment. But Andrew Navarro, you may have just convinced me that that's actually the cool thing about it. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, Larry David. You don't trust his opinion on football. Look at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, should we? I mean, it's been. It, do you want to talk about PAX right away? Sure. Yeah, we, we should can probably talk about PAX. Yeah, yeah, yeah I we wanna, should probably talk about PAX. I want to know what happened. I haven't talked to you guys about it at all. How it did was it go? Really, it was really great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it. I think. Fisher, you said 
uh, maybe like three days, four days into it, just how memorable every day seemed to be. Because we did yeah, something there... pretty much every day that was kind of stand out. Uh, yeah, there was always like just these different weird things and like not even like specifically to the show, like just these all these very memorable moments, right? Uh, like from from the random diner we went to plastered in uh, all sorts of political crap from both extremes of the political <laughs> spectrum. But uh-huh. that like just made us this wholesome breakfast to like trying to go out to dinner and being in this ominous fog. But then there being this like Christmas parade going by. Like not even show related, it was a very memorable trip. It was nice. yeah, it was a good it was a good time. Yeah, just it was really awesome. Four of you? The four of us, yep. So yeah, nice. and De V also came by and was a huge help. Uh we, it would have been it it was already <laughs> challenging, and even with him there, we were very, very busy. Uh it would have been inc- like ex- incredibly exhausting without without him there to mm. help out. We- yeah, the show was was wild. We had naively thought we were like our booth has two demo tables and this front table for doing sales. So that's like three people. That's a three person booth, right? One, yeah, two and we demoers. have like one floater to help, right? <laughs> yeah, and we were like, oh, we're set. And like, and and so like, you know, Davi had offered to help a bit, and we were like, oh yeah, sure, you know, feel free to come, tag us out or whatever. It was wild there was so many like just this flood of people and flood of interest we were like <laughs> talking until our voices went hoarse and there were five of us because davi just hung out and was just this lifesaver helping us out and like we were still all like wow dog tired by the end of each day and and so like i underestimated the number of people who needed to work by our, our booth by at least two <laughs> Yeah. How, did, how yeah. did Evan survive? I know he was feeling nervous about his abilities to, you know, showcase the game. Did he, he did rise, rise to the occasion? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. T- I took a picture of Evan doing a cramming at the last moment on uh, on Friday morning. Like rules? Uh, the show was, or... yeah, it was Friday. Yeah, it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And maybe the last like half an hour before the show, show floor opened, he was sitting at the demo table giving the demo to Fisher and then like Fisher was being like this, like playing the role of the, uh, the dense yeah. um, game player asking tough questions. Uh, but it was really great. Uh, no, he, nice. he did fantastic. Uh, he did lots of demos. I think cool. he ended up doing like being at the demo tables more, um, than we, ex- than he expected to be. Uh, nice. Uh, cause the other, the other option was standing at the front of the, booth and doing sales and then just telling people about the game uh which is what i which is what i did pretty much the whole time and that was like you're just going and going like Mm -hmm. every it was i learned so many things from this experience um one of them that i think was really cool was just seeing how important was just to be out there in, in a public forum where you could see people who have no idea who you are because Mm -hmm. i about i would say eight to nine out of ten people who came to the booth had no idea who Mm -hmm. earthborn games was or had ever seen earthborn rangers before Mm -hmm. so they'd catch evan's art you know because we had these giant uh you know 10 by 10 um well i guess they were like seven foot tall eight foot tall banners 10 foot wide maybe something like that Mm. um behind us both with you know big beautiful pieces of artwork that evan did and it would catch people's eye and then they'd come over and they'd be like what is this mm. uh you know or they'd or they'd kind of sidle up quietly and i'd be like hi hello do you know mm-hmm. about our game no would you like to know about our game and then launch mm. into it so i did a lot of uh i did a lot of giving people the short version that would sometimes go into a longer version which would sometimes lead into more like uh in-depth rules stuff or just like random com- conversations wow. but it was really great meeting a bunch of new people who had never heard of us before it was it was awesome how were how were sales like on the floor like do people buy it <laughs> up right then or yeah oh yeah we 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 underestimated uh how much to bring uh, <laughs> really so she sold them all we, we well we had sold through over two thirds of our copies at the end of the day Friday. Wow. 
Dang. And then we're like, oh crap, we could like Saturday's the busiest day. We could we could sell so much more. And so Friday night, we're at like axe throwing with some other industry folks, and like we're sitting there and we're like, okay, Flying Cloud, our fulfillment partners, only a two hour drive away. <laughs> could we get there and get more copies? And so we actually we ended up looking up like the cost of a rental car. I rented an SUV, <laughs> drove down to Baltimore, two hours away. <laughs> at five up, in the morning. At five, yeah, I had to get up at like five in the morning to make this all happen in time. Yeah. Fill, filled up the, the SUV with copies of the game and then drove back to the convention hall. Wow. And the pain was, I should have woken up even earlier because I got there after we were allowed to use the loading dock. So I had to like carry them in through the main hall. How many which did was, you get? Uh, um well we got like six more cases yeah so that what what's in the case six six copies so we got yeah, six, six, six and they're more. about they're about yeah. five pounds a piece and the first time so fisher like rolls in around 11 o'clock in the morning i want to say like that morning for us went by super fast it was like all yeah. of a sudden it was like oh my god fisher's here um <laughs> mm-hmm. but he, he comes in <laughs> like totally out of breath uh and he'd carried two cases in, in his arms through the convention center which includes like up some like big stairs and uh and through the and, hall it yeah, was such a mistake and each of those cases was <laughs> what like 35 pounds so it's like he's like carrying like 70 pounds in his arms yeah uh, it's just it's just on your fingers you know by the end yeah. gripping the edge of those boxes and like <laughs> i i luckily got a hand truck from our neighbors uh mm. which was super nice of them and uh that made it easier but we got a bunch more copies and uh, and we sold through all of those as well. So yeah. it was. Did you last it was till awesome. Sunday with the games, or that you had no barely? Left? Yeah, yeah, we just yeah. had a few, few la- left that we sold Sunday morning. Um, yeah, wow. Yeah, we were out That's... by half an hour into the show on Sunday. Wow. So yeah, it was cool. And then we had a few uh, extra add-ons. We had some, which I, I think I enumerated all of them the last episode. Uh, but yeah, we had a few wooden tokens. We had some miniatures. We had some valley play map. We had some uh, valley maps um, and some doublers. The only thing we didn't sell through were the doublers. Uh, we had enough for everyone. So, so for every other person who bought a core set to get a doubler, but it ended up being more like about a quarter of the people who got a core set got a doubler, which was also good to see because that will help me like calibrate what print run should be for for something like that in the future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so through all of our art books that we brought, we were like 24 copies of the world book. We probably could have sold more of that. Um, mm. yeah, it was awesome. Sales were great. Sales were great. That's amazing. Did you get any, uh, visitors from people from podcast listeners? We did. Oh, yeah. 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 Nice. Podcast um, listeners, discord members. That's awesome. Yeah. D chance was D- there. Yeah. D chance. <laughs> yeah, had, had a good conversation with the Uh Yeah, no, it was uh, to all of you who did stop by. Thank you so much. It was good to put faces to the names. Uh, it's funny because like people never quite look like I expect them to look. I don't know what I'm picturing, right? But right. like, you know, such like, a weird thing we do. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's it's, it's you bizarre. make an association for no reason whatsoever, <laughs> and then you see them, you're like, you're not what you're supposed to look like. Yeah. <laughs> You're this icon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, any any more uh, I'll, I'll, stories? I'll just from say there? that, like, Time. for those of you who haven't checked out PAX Unplugged, I was very impressed by the show. It's big. It's bigger than I thought it would be. Hmm. But, like, I don't know if it was because we're with this kind of, like, positive indie studio or it's just the vibe of the show, but like compared to a lot of my time at Gen Con, the vibe was just way nicer and like I don't know, more well, friendlier. Fun. You mean, right? Yeah, friend, friendlier. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just, just way friendlier and and more chill than a lot of my experiences with Gen Con. So, and on top of that, like they've got this awesome food market right next to it, instead of just having to go to food trucks or whatever, like. I I was very impressed with the convention. I like definitely want to go back. 
Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll be back next next year for sure. This is a question of where else we'll be in the meantime. But yeah, we'll be back at PAX Unplugged. I think 100%. Well, I got to go next time because that sounds too fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. We rented it. We rented a house. Yeah. Because I, I was, because I slacked early on and, and didn't get a hotel in time. But then I, but then I thought, why, why get a hotel if I can get a house? Um, yeah. So I, it everyone. was cheaper than a hotel. Um, I bet. A little bit, a little bit of a drive um, mm. with a, with like a lift, but it was like five minutes. Um, yeah, the the only downside is like one day we forgot a thing and I needed to like scramble back. And right. if it was just the hotel, <laughs> it would have been easier. Mm. But like it was so much more pleasant to just stay in the house. Uh, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. Potential hauntings aside. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My <laughs> random noises in the night. <laughs> yeah, we had a three story, like this three story historical like uh, condo, I guess. I don't know how you describe it. Like split split house, um, duplex, I guess maybe. Um, and I was at the very top of this th- three levels, and it was this big, like, vaulted ceiling where I was. And every night, there was this plinking sound, like a kind of like a tapping or like a knocking. Mm-hmm. But it would move. Like, at first, I thought it was like water dripping. But then it would migrate through the room and along the walls. And sometimes it was above my head. Sometimes it was, like, at the foot of the bed. Sometimes it was in the wall to the left. Uh, mm-hmm. It was always like three, four o'clock in the morning. Wake me up. This click, clicking sound. I have no idea what it was. Yeah. I was like, I, Def- just, I, just, I just assumed it's a ghost of some kind. <laughs> Definitely Benjamin Franklin trying to tell you something. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> well, I, we, Doesn't we, he have we anything better at- to do? Evan and I walked by his grave. Maybe we, we, we picked him up on the way. <laughs> yeah, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, I think uh, it was really great meeting people. It's great seeing people. It was great seeing people, you know, former coworkers. Uh, it was awesome. Um, meeting some manufacturers was super cool. Meeting some media, uh, lots of media stopped by. Nice. And uh, that was cool. Yeah, jet. Like the only the only interaction I had where I was like, or I've been back in my mind. You know, when you meet when you talk to somebody, and you're like, oh, I wish I'd done that better. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you guys know what that feels like. Yeah, or not? <laughs> oh, um, absolutely. So, <laughs> I, I had this inter- <laughs> this interaction with Jack from uh, the Cardboard Herald, and uh, like when I saw him, like you know, I'm used to seeing him on this little screen, and like his proportions are such where, like, I don't know, like I, he looks like he's a smaller person, <laughs> or like maybe it's because I just see him on like a tiny screen. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I just. I, I don't ever, I don't know. Sometimes I just, things just come out of my mouth. And like, when I saw him for the first time, he said, oh, hi. I was like, hey, Jack, it's good to see you. I was, I was like, you're so much larger than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> the word he's like, what a weird, he's like, what a weird thing to say. I'm like, well, you know, it's so, like you're all zoomed in because I'm used to seeing you on a screen. <laughs> the word oh, larger. Is funny. Larger. I, I had the I had the same sensation with Anders though. Anders, I did not picture you nearly as tall as you are. And then <laughs> the first time like I met you, you like walked into my basement, and like you know you kind of was... came down the stairs, and I was like, this guy just doesn't end. Like he just kept getting taller. <laughs> I thought but, I warned you. I, I feel like I, I mentioned it on I, the I show. I, if you did, I didn't. I don't remember. I was definitely yeah. surprised by how tall you were when I met you. <laughs> Well, you said like, uh, well, yeah, obviously, I'm seven foot five, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> NBA star. It is weird. It is. It is interesting though. You do people like look like they'd be a certain size, you know? Yeah. I think that you guys are both exactly what I would have envisioned oh, okay. before I met perfect. you. We're perfectly <laughs> proportioned. <laughs> yeah. yeah, proportions fit. Like what? <laughs> like it's a sh- it's like a head to shoulder ratio or something that tells uh-huh. you if they're going to be tall or short. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, Jack. He had this like, like a kind of like showbiz face, mm-hmm. where his face, you know, like how people who have, in showbiz have like kind of like larger faces, oh, so yeah, like yeah. head size. Yeah. He, and <laughs> on the screen, he looks more kind of I don't know, I would kind of categorize him as almost like gnomish. <laughs> you know, like is that kind of like a Fay thing going on? Does but he in person, I'm like he's a he's a big he dude. Listen? Like I don't know. Like he's like he's tall. He's got huge hands. So like, he's more of an ogre than a gnome. 
<laughs> no, not hey, a, you're, you're not helping not the case all. for saying weird things to him yeah, here, Andrew. You know, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm just going in and all, all the way. Like, yeah. uh, I was very, like, just, I was struck by his, by his physical presence. Uh, he's just he's a striking, interesting looking dude, striking, handsome presence. If you're listening, exactly, yeah, Jack. exactly. Great topics here, guys. Um, <laughs> Well, we have plenty of questions. Do we want to, um, I didn't look at them yet. Are they in depth? Do we want to do work stories still, or was that work stories? No, I think that's good enough. Yeah, that's, that's probably good. We, we can right. dive in some questions. We got a bunch. We can cut it short if we need to, but there, there's some good ones in there. Okay. So we're going straight into our special segment then. Yeah, let's do it. Our new segment. It's called Our Question for Darren. As you all know, Darren the Dependable uh, asks us a question every week. And how rude of us. We've never asked him a question. Right? I'm just winging this intro, you guys. Are you impressed? It's great. No, it's all right. good. Um, you're doing great. <laughs> you're you're so, doing great until you called it out. <laughs> That's funny. Some guy, I had a long conversation about like public speaking skills with this guy today. And that was one of the points. Like, don't point out when you've screwed up. Um, and there you go. But that's, that's my style that everyone's grown to love, isn't it? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so our question, who wrote this one? Uh, I did. Yeah. Andrew has a question for you, Darren, which I think is a great question. It is, uh, what is it that drew you to Earthborn, Darren? And what has kept you around for the past two years? And that's crazy. This podcast is almost two years old. Yeah, exactly. And the game, yeah. the game is older, right? Like the, the inception of the game. Much older. Yes. Yeah. So, do we... I think it would be fun to answer the question. Where is he going to answer it? On Discord? I, I We'll see. I assume he'll send... Who knows? It'd be up to him on he, Discord. He, he, answered email. The question, he answered your off-the-cuff question about his hair on... Uh... On, on discord under so i i'm sure he'll, he'll probably oh, answer on what discord did he say? um oh crap. i asked him, no, I asked him what did i ask he, he made what a snarky remark about, what color he, is your hair he, he, yeah. he made the snarky remark about how it's it's getting more gray in these recent okay. years <laughs> but <laughs> um uh, yeah yeah darren you can answer on on discord or in the youtube comments or on email whatever you want and uh well well the segment is called questions for darren uh it, it it extends to all of you I, and any of you who want to tell us like what originally drew you to the game or to finding us uh we, we would love to hear it so uh and yeah jump in the comments and let us know how you originally discovered us rambling uh about our game <laughs> i would say especially if you've been here for every episode like yeah yeah to I, like it's 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 i think it's really cool that that we have an audience and mm-hmm. i'm always uh, really grateful f- f- to see how many people watch our <laughs> these youtube videos and yeah listen to our podcast and you know the game just came out in the states like it's finally out so it's been like two years of just listening to the guys talk about <laughs> making a thing that doesn't exist yet. A so, game that might no. be in your hands one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's really cool that people like, have hung around. So what? I'm really curious. And um, has anybody uh, watched this all this time and then just been like hugely disappointed by the game? And do you, oh, can, I don't know. Do you no, hope don't they have, they have, Yeah, don't answer that one. Yeah, we and will you still, will you still, do you still have interest in listening to us? After the big letdown that was the game for you, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I don't I can't imagine that anybody would be interested this long and then not like the game. Just doesn't make sense. Yeah, um, who knows? Yeah, no. I mean, like I'm mostly in, involved in Earthborn as the podcast guy, so I love that people listen to this. Um, it feels greater than just about this game to me. Yeah, at this point, it's just like a fun time talking yeah. to some guys. Absolutely. Um, all right. Great. Now let's get into the, to Darren's question to us this week. Just uh, the us and Darren podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Title. Okay. Um, welcome back home from PAX Unplugged. I don't know if you all had much time to see the rest of the show floor outside of the Earthborn Games booth, but if you did, did you get a sense that Earthborn Games is leading a trend in sustainable tabletop game manufacturing? Or does it feel like most of your peers are still conducting business as usual? 
Did I, you notice anything, Fisher? I don't think I did. Well, one uh, one interaction that really stuck out to me um, was with uh, Eric, the designer of Spirit Island. Mm, mm. Um, so he stopped by the booth and like he kind of opened by just saying thank you for everything you are doing for the industry um and like was very kind of um interested in talking about the like you know the sustainability angle and like the positivity angle and everything and that really that really stuck with me obviously because I, I love spirit island so it's it's very nice to hear um from him but like also just like he felt like he was seeing ripples of some of the stuff we were doing so that that felt pretty good um and like obviously we have over the last couple of years while we've been doing this seen some movement especially like with panda getting fsc paper and stuff panda being the manufacturer we've talked about it on this podcast before but they're one of the most prolific manu board game manufacturers in the world if not the most prolific board game manufacturer i don't, I don't know if anybody who makes at least serves nobody serves as many different studios as Panda does. Um, but them getting like certain materials has helped a lot. And like Jamie Stegmeyer's done a lot of work with Stonemeyer games and like pushing them more towards sustainability. And he mentions our Kickstarter and our studio in his very first blog post about it. So anyway, like I from like that conversation and stuff, definitely feel like there's been a trend over the last couple of years um but at the show specifically i saw a couple mentions of it but like other than that i think there was a lot of business as usual but it's like we didn't get a lot of time unfortunately to like spend on the show floor since we were working our booth <laughs> yeah or fortunately yeah i think like uh <laughs> uh Definitely conversations at the booths. I didn't get a chance to talk to the designer of Spirit Island, um, but I did talk to other people, and I, I did get the sense from speaking to them that uh, there is a general sense, much like uh, what the designer of Spirit Island um, expressed to you, that we were that people kind of saw us as kind of the first people through the door, even though we weren't necessarily. But I think we were one of the um, more publicly visible uh, to the industry um, projects that got people's attention um, just because I think of our association with like fancy flight games and pedigree we came up in with, and then the style of game we're doing, which isn't like a game about nature or there's, there's nature in the game, right? The nature plays a big role of it, but it's not like, a game where you have animals and you're moving them around uh, or you're like some abstract Euro thing with animals and plants on it uh, or a game about the ecology. It has all those things as themes, but it's not a game of that. And I think a lot of like environmentally focused games are typically what I'm just was talking about where it doesn't really grab people's attention as much. Um, so I think there were a few of those before we started, but uh, I did really get the impression from people that um, that they liked where the industry was going in this regard, and they credited us for helping to lead the way, which is pretty awesome. Cool. cool. All right. Thanks, Darren. Next question comes from Quacks. After playing for a while, something I noticed is that the path deck is a lot smaller than similar games like Arkham or Lord of the Rings. What was the driver for this? Yeah, so like our you know our terrain sets in the game are only twelve cards, as opposed to um, a lot of the Arkham sets. You know, for a given scenario, you're combining like a handful of their different sets together to form that deck, and like I don't I don't remember the exact size on average, but it's it's significantly deeper than ours. So th there's a couple reasons for that. Like, one, we have this kind of mechanic of finding things in the path deck. So 
we needed that deck to be shallow enough that like even if you're not using scout or search or other effects like that you could have a chance of coming across the things but we also wanted players to kind of learn the terrain sets um and like kind of learn them like you learn a meta in a competitive game where you know like when you sit down for you know your weekly rounds of this game and you go against a deck you've never played this person before but you see their deck and you kind of know what they're doing we wanted that same feeling when you encountered a new uh, a terrain type that you've played before it's like okay well i know how my deck fights against this deck and uh having that kind of smaller set of cards helps um l lastly like just there's you know our unique locations shuffle cards into the train sets and like we wanted to maintain a ratio while also not having like multiple copies of a unique character because you know that's their one card so a few different things went into what keeps kind of those path cards you're coming across well those i'd say small. i'd say too that like if you're it, it's tough to make a one-to-one -one comparison to uh to arkham obviously because the games are trying to do different things but i i do think that if you consider that you might move from like path to like location to location and encounter multiple path sets in a single day, um, if you were to imagine that from the Arkham perspective, like you would effectively like take all those sets and shuffle them all together into one big deck. Mm -hmm. So if you think about moving from one path deck to another to a, to another, uh, you're you're really looking at you know I don't know say you traveled like three times you're maybe looking at 45 cards total in your in that deck except you're just doing it in segments so it's it, i think it's kind of an illusion that the decks are thin um because you're not necessarily intended just to sit in one place and dig through the entire thing um but they can get pretty thick too later on because you know obviously you add <laughs> yeah. the, you add the valley set you those three cards you might add some missions you might add some weather cards or some mission, like some other stuff uh, so they can they can get deeper for sure and do, <laughs> especially later on in the campaign. Thanks for your question, Quacks. There's more to your question. Sorry. While drawing from the challenge deck is fun, during design were any other randomization systems thought of? I had a hot minute where I thought about dice, but then stopped because <laughs> <laughs> dice and card games are challenging. You're like. Uh, oh yeah, I'm not not con not considering Destiny. Uh, I think <laughs> that, uh, well, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's something about keep sticking it on, keeping it on the cards. Like you could totally take the mm. system we have and then make dice to match and make mm -hmm. that work if that's what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I think the the feeling is more appropriate to the game since it's a card game to take that card off the top, bring it over, flip mm -hmm. it like that whole process is, is pretty enjoyable. Uh, yeah. The reveal is really fun. Rolling dice is fun. I've said many times before, like I love rolling dice and I think it's great. I just don't think it's, the, I don't think it would been the right fit for Rangers. Yeah. Do you agree Fisher? Yeah, the deck lets us do some cool things too. Like we can scout the challenge deck and like set right. it up and plan right. it ahead. Whereas like with dice and, and you know like the tokens, like an Arkham the bag, you can do some other cool things. But I like what the deck format enables us to do design space wise and like things we can explore later. Nice. All right. Next question. We're blazing through them because there's a lot. Here we go. Good question. <laughs> um, Grisan gr Grisament Grisamentum. I think it's like Grisanthemum, like, like a Chrysanthemum, but like yeah. maybe. But it's not. It's Grisamentum. Grisamentum. Yeah, I know you're right. That doesn't quite. Grisamt Grisamentum. <laughs> Grisamentum. <laughs> um, <clears throat> your parents should not have named you that. Too hard to say. Um, much, Who are you to judge? <laughs> how much? How much have you thought about migratory patterns of the beings in EBR? Is it possible we see path deck compositions change as seasons do? 
along the same line, what about nocturnal beings? Mm-hmm. You're, yeah, you you're you reading my see, thoughts, Chrysanthemum. Yeah, you can see why I grabbed <laughs> this one. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's that's all fertile ground and definitely stuff that we've uh, discussed. Um, I think doing something where you're moving where you're effectively either mixing path decks or we do different versions of path decks that have different different animals in them or maybe move animals from one uh from one path set to another or some combination of those things mm-hmm. would be really awesome and um I don't know how many times have I have I mentioned Fisher like <laughs> wanting to do the the nocturnal the night uh, expansion, oh, yeah. uh, lots of times. So, uh, that's definitely on our, that's on our list. This yeah, is a like question I of think, how we do it. Yeah, exactly how we do it. I think like there was, we had some interest in trying to integrate it into the normal gameplay. Like you can stay up for the night and like keep on doing stuff between days and like that, but then you have to use nocturnal cards and like that makes mm-hmm. things much more difficult. Cause I don't know, I don't know if any of you have hiked at night. But so like, what was it? It was two years ago. I was doing a superior hiking trail stint by myself. So I was solo. And like, I had this, like, I was on this overlook as the sun was setting. And I was like, oh, this is beautiful. I was like, okay, I'm going to make my dinner here. So I, I like got my cooking stuff out, made my dinner on this overlook, watched the sunset. But it meant I had to hike the remainder in the, at night after the sun went down. Uh, and I have a headlamp. But it is awful. It is terrifying. <laughs> like, because like yeah. as soon as you you know the, the sun, the moon was out. But like once you get into the trees, it's just pitch black, and you you just like it feels like all your every sound around you is just amplified. And like I had the cone of what I could see from my flashlight, and that's it. Yeah. So anyway, that, that sounds experience. scary. If if and when we do <laughs> nocturnal path decks, that'll be the experience. Is just. <laughs> the darkness around you yeah yeah Blair i Witch think that'd Project. be really fun it's just like i think it's a question of like how far we go because there's part of me that just wants you know let's just do an alternate path set at night for every path set in the main game and just make mm. that the expansion that's <laughs> so much work and then all yeah. your then all your location art is still during the day so you better replace all that with nighttime art <laughs> uh-huh yeah. it'll just be a black a black card that you just put over the over the artwork <laughs> or, yeah just like a trans like 50% gradient that you just yep. like put down and it just darkens the whole card uh-huh <laughs> done yeah no done. i think that looks i think that sounds great and i think there's really fun stuff to do uh even with the Especially with the setting and uh, different th- different different beings that could come out at night, let's just say that could be really fun to play with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The the last thing I'll say about your your question here is the seasons one is something we've also been very interested in, though it poses some challenges. And I think some people, in response to this question on Discord, mentioned a couple of these challenges. One of them is just like what our gameplay represents in setting time wise, because like each of our play sessions is a day. And they currently string together into like effectively a month of playtime. Uh, so like basically seas- seasonal play at the scope of time the game represents at the moment, seasonal play kind of has to by necessity take place with like in like a whole new campaign, right? Because just not enough time passes during our average game to explore that. But we have some ideas for some future content that could let us kind of dip our toes into exploring some seasonal stuff. Um, so uh, you'll just have to stay tuned to see how, if and how that's realized. Hmm. Nice, 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 nice. And in case any of the YouTube watchers are closely observing me, my screen, I just removed a splinter from my foot. So that's why I was looking. <laughs> That's why. I, that's why I was looking down during that session there. Um, though I, I normally wouldn't call it a splinter, but a sliver. We call it sliver here. Yeah, sliver, sliver. Um, all right. Uh, next question is very well written, so I'd like to try to do it justice here. It's from Solar J. I've recently finished the campaign and treated myself to a cup of tea while reading the lore book by the fire. The picture is illuminated by flame. My daughter gravitated to read over my shoulder. We had great fun talking about the animals and features of the valley. Of all the lore, she was fascinated by the Terravore, 
much like Quizzy. For the last few days, she keeps asking, how does it work? So at the <laughs> risk of fatiguing out, I asked her if she would like me to ask the designers. Her question to you is simply, how? In relation to the, <laughs> in relation to the Terravor, and yes, we did read the entry, which I believe has only fueled the flames of curiosity. <laughs> so how? Oh, that's so that's so great. I love that so much. Uh, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I, well, you know, if you if you read the lore book entry, the World of Earthborn Rangers entry on the Terravor, and encounter the Terravor in the game. And you come away from it wondering how it's done. I say that's mission accomplished. Mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because I always, I don't know, I always think that it's more fun to speculate on how than to actually say how. Because uh, mm -hmm. once you say how, then the, all the mystery is gone. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, I, you know, I, I'm no bioengineer. I don't know how it's done. I don't know how that <laughs> thing works. <laughs> I have more ideas about where it goes and where it came from, but that's just going to raise more questions. <laughs> is it like a big, like, is that the one that looks like a big, uh, like a tremors thing? Like uh, a big sure. worm? Like a big yeah, worm? Yeah, a big like, kind of worm thing. Yeah. I just had yeah, this idea yeah. one day to do that. Um, yeah. It just came to me. Uh, and yeah, yeah, one, they, of the, one of the first sketches that I did for the setting. They cool. consume like the land in front of them, and they move slowly and inexorably forward. Like, uh, what what did we determine? It was like half a meter, quarter of a meter a, a day, quarter a meter a day. Yeah, yeah. But it's like bioengineered yeah. to help like recover the environment, right? Yes, uh, yeah. yeah. So like, as it passes over things, it like it's is meant to eat refuse, and then mm -hmm. uh, it vents out this. The like gas, like you know, breathable air and other beneficial things out of its back. And then in its wake, it leaves like fertile, fertile land mm -hmm. um, where new things can grow. So like how do worms work? You know, that's basically just a big worm, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like a big worm. Yeah. It's kind of like a big worm. They fertilize. Um, yeah. Just, I was like, I love the idea. Of this is these giant mysterious beings just slowly moving their way across the surface of the earth and people just and leave then, them alone yeah and then like they eventually they go into they they emerge from an ocean and then they go into an ocean so you just imagine them also on the floor of the ocean going someplace um mm. i think that's cool <laughs> So imagine, I, just like, I, I just like what it does to my imagination. I, I don't really, uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't know how they work. I imagine that Solar J will play this response for his daughter. Do you think she'll be satisfied with what you've said? No, but that's great. <laughs> I, would, I, would say, I would say, well, you tell me how they work. How do you think they work? And I think that's that answer one. is just as valid as any answer anyone could give because it's meant to excite your curiosity and your your imagination yeah yeah i love it okay great question next one next question from sm tilson has anyone finished a solo campaign as a complete pacifist like not using card effects to do harm it seems like the next stage would be a vegan run no animal <laughs> companions no ranger reward cards that do harm or are deemed to be non-vegan <laughs> we do they use leather so leather they, they do use leather yeah evan loves to draw leather so I, there's uh -huh. gotta be um we would need a ruling on pocketed belt pouch for example oh there you go is uh -huh. it made out of leather oh okay <laughs> i should just keep reading i should just keep reading the questions what other cards might this affect is the meditation pillow stuffed with feathers do non-animal <laughs> product do non-animal product alternatives exist in the world of Earthborn? I left in the, this whole question because I liked the the whole line of thinking here. Is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, like Andrew, you know the setting better than I do, but like from my reading of stuff, I feel like there isn't as much of a focus on like, you know, vegan materials, right? They do use right. leather. They're going to use feathers. Like they're not, 
necessarily this isn't the society that necessarily like is completely pacifist and not interacting with the creatures or potentially killing creatures but when they do they're doing so more responsibly than we are today right like exactly they, yeah they're kind of sustainably hunting and living in their environment instead of like unsustainably you know industrializing it or you know hunting things to extinction or whatever right so exactly the full vegan run would be tricky is what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah i don't know if it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily exist yeah it's it's it is pretty much exactly like you described fisher uh it's a it's a responsible use of resources right it's like i feel like you know veganism feels like a response to industrialized food mm -hmm. which you know has so many downsides and is like oftentimes incredibly cruel um and just our economy is like cruel to animals so like there's a lot of reasons where you could be like, ah, you know what? I I don't want to participate in that. And then they're now you're vegan. But yeah. I like that's yeah, this is just not the world these people live in. Like they uh they're very much in touch and respectful of everything around them. Um so yeah, they'll uh, but I, I do think that there are, you know, there there I think I've played around with the idea of like thematically thinking of, you know, hunting being less of a thing now than it used to be, where there's more, you know, fishing and foraging whereas in the past maybe they hunted more and that's kind of a um more of a traditional thing in the in the valley like characters like cordo are are hunters but maybe uh like hunting is is kind of seen more of as an art as opposed to an, an absolute necessity um but uh but yeah actual vegan run would be hard but you could like do just like vegetarian uh you know like you just eat eat berries and things you're allowed to put harm on berries or maybe you don't put harm on anything like you you don't eat any, say no anything harm at all <laughs> yeah if you're well, a total was, pacifist I, I, you're not putting harm on cherry moss or on sunberry brambles like that'd be pretty amazing well at first <laughs> i was gonna say going like traveler explorer would be good because it's mostly traversal stuff but the problem is even there like the iron wool boots um even the reverb locket is being held on the, as you said anders evan likes it to let draws leather it's being held <laughs> on le leather gloved hands <laughs> the adaptive multi-tool i think i think that's a leather glove on the hand there uh -huh. so uh yeah you're, you're pretty limited yeah everyone's got leather of some kind on them pretty much <laughs> uh mm -hmm. in that artwork a belt or yeah. a pouch or something mm -hmm. yeah they like they like their their Sitka and Artelope leather. <laughs> I still think Traveler Explorer might be the way you could get it done. Moments moment art is abstract enough that like if you run a lot of moments, mm -hmm. you're not running into uh, non-vegan stuff on your in your card yeah. cards. <laughs> well, even <laughs> art, artwork notwithstanding, I think like just being completely pacifist, not placing any harm at all, would be like really hard. Even in my pacifist, my quote-unquote pacifist run, like I'd had quiet there sometimes. Like, like I'd just be a role player. Like I can't control that animal. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I'd also use the uh the Orlin Thumper. Hmm. which dealt harm but didn't you know i wasn't clearing anything from harm so that that's that was the line that i drew was that i was not clearing anything from harm uh myself mm -hmm. but sometimes you needed to you know bop a luchal on the nose mm -hmm. yeah my my two-handed <laughs> playthrough what a bopping came pretty close to no to like pacifist not not to vegan <laughs> but <laughs> at least to pacifist i um it was a one of my characters was like an explorer traverse bomb type person and then my other was kind of the art an artificer build and they got pretty close yeah i mean i'm i'm better at the game now than i was when i played through it the first time so maybe i could do it i'd be willing to try it i mean the game is kind of designed so that you do as little harm as possible, right? 
It feels yeah, that yeah. way. Well, like I said, the first time I played through, like I, I didn't, I, I, I went through pacifist, but maybe with an asterisk on, on it. Uh, but I didn't clear mm-hmm. anything from harm. Right. Myself. Yeah. Sometimes other things did it for yeah, me. Yeah, it happens. Mm. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So would that count? And, and I may or may not have engineered situations where that happened. <laughs> 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 All right. Moving on. Next question is from Tobin L. Given that the card dividers are a little short when sleeving your cards, would you consider adding a set of larger dividers to the next campaign? Perhaps as an add-on. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. I I was trying to figure out what he meant Mm because I I noticed this as well. Uh, Yeah, I don't think we're going to do it as an add-on, but there will be ways if you get the new stuff that you should have effectively replacements for all of your dividers if it works out how i want are they saying like because the dividers don't stand up very much beyond the... they're just yeah exactly because they're just sort of dinky S- like slight slightly larger than the others they poke up nice they poke up a decent amount if you don't sleeve your cards but the moment you sleeve your cards mm-hmm. they're just too short you can't read them yeah okay uh, you know, I so yeah, I I I ended up taking a uh, old deck of playing cards and kind of taping them to the back just to kind of yeah. give them an extra little lift, and that works fine. Uh, but obviously, you don't want to have to do that. <laughs> yeah, they were definitely smaller than we wanted, and that was a uh, that was a that was a whole thing with the factory. Um, mm. which I, I caught it, but it was you know in their eyes too late, so we were stuck. Mm. Um, so uh yeah so we'll be doing taller dividers for everything going forward but like i said i think the way i've kind of got it mathed out and the components laid out i think if you were to get stewards of the valley and legacy of the ancestors uh you should have everything you need to replace everything from the Mm. core game if you wanted cool all right. Uh, next question is from Paul W. Can you share any advice to others trying to follow in your footsteps to self-publish a narrative card game? For example, how close to done was EBR before you before the first Kickstarter? And for the upcoming GameFound campaign, how close to done will the expansion be? So Andrew, sure? I feel like this is, I feel like I this I'll is answer for you, Andrew. Oh, you want yeah. me to do it? Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to answer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what <laughs> yeah, do you want to say? Yeah, what is your advice, Andrew? we're talking, so I was going to wing it. Um, <laughs> no, I have, uh, I have no idea. It seemed like you just pretty much had the idea, concept. Yeah, well, um, I think this game is, obviously, it's a lot of work. Um, and I think I, I, I credit, I think a, getting it done with a lot of things, but I think one of the biggest things is having a strong vision to start and then, um, building upon that and also not being afraid to change directions, um, as you go, uh, if you find something you're just as dissatisfied with, uh, but you know, I, I guess I could go on and on about all like the little pieces of advice. Yeah, I, say, that I think are just true about projects in general, not even just card games. Just having a strong vision is important for anything that you want to set out and do. That's difficult because that'll help carry you through. Um, but well, I, le- I like what he honed it into there. Like, yeah, how, clo- like, how close to done should it be? Yeah, we did a little graph, a little graphic during the Kickstarter that showed like rangers on this path going left to right that showed generally where things were. Uh, I don't, I don't remember because we were just kind of, you know, spitballing where we were percentage wise done with things like artwork and design. Uh, I want to say the design was about nine. I think we said it was like about 90% done. Uh, yeah, I think we rated the design is pretty done. There was a bunch of writing and like development left to do yeah. and then a ton of art. Like we, <laughs> We had some art at the beginning, but like the vast majority of the art you see in the final game wasn't done at that point. Yeah. And I think we're our, our little art ranger was near the beginning. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, it was definitely the furthest ranger back out of the little path. Uh, 
Yeah. So like terms of overall percentage, maybe 50 ish percent done at the start of the Kickstarter campaign for the next one. Um, the expansion is nearly done. Um, yeah. By the time it goes to the game found starts, it'll basically be finished. Yeah. Yep. So really all that we're waiting on right now is for Sam and I to finish writing the campaign guide. And uh, that's just a lot of text. So Sam's done a ton of writing and then I've still have to read and then do some editing on a lot of entries. Uh, but we're hoping to be done. We're hoping to be done a couple of months ago, but it just keeps pushing on because there's always something else to do that pulls me away. Uh, but we really have to get it done. So we're going to start giving uh, giving it to our foreign partners for localization, giving them what's done so far so that we can kind of get going on it while we finish it. Um, but yeah, I would say 95, it's about 95% done right now. And then by the time the campaign actually launches, it will be, you know, 98. We might have a few outstanding art pieces left just based on the pace. So quite different than, but very different. Yeah. But but to your question about self-publishing a narrative card game, one of my pieces of advice, specifically because you say narrative card game, is to this conversation about how much is done is is just carefully consider and manage scope. Um, card games are a lot of work, <laughs> it, both mechanically, but especially art wise. Like card games just have an art need because you know like a, a role-playing book or something you can fill in with words but like every card needs a piece of art and so like there's just an art need to get through your card count that's pretty wild and then like the narrative just requires a ton of writing and dependencies and so signing up for a narrative card game you're kind of signing yourself up for one of the more burdensome art type games and one of the more burdensome writing type games at the same time uh and so just be cognizant of that because most other games, most of your competitors aren't dealing with both of those burdens. Some competitors aren't dealing with either. <laughs> and so um, just be be very cognizant of your scope in since you specified that you're looking at a narrative card game and like consider your scope from all those different angles. That'd be my main piece of advice. Yeah. And then getting people around you who can help, I think also really important like i don't know if you're, if you're doing it by yourself like that's a lot <laughs> yeah can you make a small narrative card game sure oh yeah totally i mean so it maybe... depends on what you're trying to do like is it like uh i i backed and got uh spires end hildegard and i think you would technically call that like a narrative card game it's kind of like a choose your own adventure-ish style card game but it's I, I think it would if you were to ask me is spires and hildegard a narrative card game i'd say yes so but it's also you know incredibly different than what what we did or what any of the cooperative lcgs do mm -hmm. um or you know is seventh continent a narrative card game yes tile laying game i don't know what would you call that yeah that, cards question, square cards it's like technically cards but it's not really card play as anybody would define it right so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it's it's a pretty broad definition so i i think and you can do things a lot of different ways um i think a lot of the challenge we had was in making a open world narrative card game uh i think if you're doing something that's more linear that eliminates a lot of complexity right off the bat great question great answers cap and ahab says we all know that a group of whales is a pod <laughs> or a group of owls is called a parliament we all know this for the sake of earthborn lore could you define some collective nouns for the variety of critters found in the game for example <laughs> a lawn of caustic mulchers perhaps <laughs> that's great and also great so I, I assume you're referencing lawn talk <laughs> <laughs> that's a callback yeah <laughs> good question wow be creative guys improv let's go have you thought of anything anders as you as you've been playing <laughs> like, thought, you see this what a this group of these beings what should this group of lutronals be called don't they ha already have it do, aren't they already called something 
Yeah, I guess it, they have the Holt, but I've always Holt, wondered, yeah. like, is that their pod or is that their home? I always kind of thought it was more of like their, um, like okay. a beaver dam, like a Lutronol Holt. Yeah, a Holt, Holt is a real word. Uh, yeah. It just means like a den. Right. Um, like an stack, otter's den. A stack I, I, of Sitka. Talked... This is, <laughs> this is. A a sack how about a sack a sack <laughs> I, I realize now that we're talking about this that we've totally discussed this before on this podcast have we? I rem- yes we we have because i remember talking about what a group of luchinals would be right and like I, thinking I asked, down that line well i asked that question i remember prior but i don't think it was about like what are other groups so we got sack of sitkas but <laughs> but don't you think like I, anything of that type in on earth is always called a herd right like yeah you wouldn't just change herd. it yeah like it would be it's a herd of zebras it's a herd of elk it's a uh-huh. herd it's always a herd but what's like I a think... new type of creature in the game what's something that's not unprecedented in nature uh well, like those... crawler oh Buffer yeah crawlers I don't know what you call those, though. A group, a glob, a group of upper crawlers. A, gl- <laughs> a glob. <laughs> a glob. <laughs> well, those words, those words rarely actually mean anything, right? Like murder That's of true. crows. Murder of crows. Parliament. That's very true. That's very true. I mean, owls are very stately, so the parliament, you know. Ah, true, true, true. Pod. A pod of whales. Um, let's do one more. What's another creature in the game? Is unprecedented and well. There's the tene- there's the tenebra. They're just kind of like a collective a noun. Loom of, on their, a loom, loom of tenebra. tenebra. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Ooh, I yeah. Like See, that. these are good. These are good. I like that. Well, which things did I do? The the bats. What are what is a group of bats? The night. What are flock, they called? Night night crib flock bats? of bats. A flock of bats. A storm. A storm of bats. Ooh, I like that. Group of bats. It's called Cauldron of Bats. Colony, you're right, Andrew. It's a colony. <laughs> colony, okay, yeah, okay. Colony of bees, colony of bats, colony of ants. Are colonies when there's some kind of like telepathy like the living situation. involved? The living? Yeah, I thought Fla- that like colony would be like they, they're they cohabitating in a place. I don't know if... Uh... Mm. Colonies, camps, clouds, <laughs> cloud bats. Cla- cloud of bats is cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cloud of bats. They are kind of a cloud, aren't they? Yeah. I love this kind of mild-mannered banter we're having right now. <laughs> Just <laughs> speculating what... This is why people have tuned in for two years. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I feel like we're like firing on all cylinders right now. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is what it's all about. I could... <laughs> I would I would sit here and just you know name another creature, see what we come up with. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Ahab. That was a good question. That was good. One more. Hit me with another one. What's one more creature in the valley? Scroffs. Oh. Scruffs. Scroffs. Scroffs. Scroff. Yeah, they're like the the plow uh, tusked, oh, boar like beings oh, in the yeah, grasslands. They, uh, a snuffle of scruffs. A snuffle. Ooh. <laughs> I like that a, a lot. A snuffle of scruffs. snuffle of scruffs. Yeah. All right. That's the winner. That's very good. Okay. Let's move on from this pleasant talk to good old Daniel. Daniel says, now that most people are receiving their copies of the game, And hopefully diving in, I'm hoping we can get into more light spoilers if possible. What are people's favorite NPC in the game and favorite mission? I'd have to say my favorite NPC is probably Dace? 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 What is it? Dace. 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 Or Cassende. Cassende? They're both so cool. I have never, I have not met these people yet. I'm not really so done. We're already spoiling. It's, it's, some people get just, mad at just oh this. Oh no. We've already just spo- too spoiled, much. Just spoiled Anders. There's someone named Dace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they're cool. <laughs> they're cool. Ah. Oh yeah, no. We, well, th- this does bring up an interesting question. Should we like create like a spoiler segment that we do at the end of the show or something so that we can start <sighs> talking about spoilers now that the game is out? You know that people this, can skip if they want. This is actually so. I, I had I had a thought because you know we're coming up 
we're coming up on our 50th episode. Wow. Believe it or not. Dang. And I was thinking, man, we should do something special, like some 50th epi- episode extravaganza is this, thing. Is this 43? This 44? would be 42. 42. So, yeah. Know, eight, so we have, eight more we episodes have a ways to go. Actually, like four months away. So by that, <laughs> by that yeah, time, uh, I think we could totally do spoilers. And I'll have, I haven't played the game since last episode. Um, so I'm still kind of early on in the game. So I wouldn't want to be spoiled. Yeah. So I think uh, I think maybe maybe for our fiftieth episode extravaganza, maybe we do a, a spoiler cast and just talk a about live everything. taping at the the Palace Theater. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> people could ask their spoiler their spoiler specific <laughs> questions. They could share all their spoilery things that they enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could pull from the campaign uh, the campaign discussion Discord and all the cool things people are posting there. Yeah, I think that could be. I think so. That everybody could be cool. fun. play and finish the game by what March? <laughs> yeah, by March. <laughs> by March, I will do yeah. so. Not counting all the people who will have just backed to the game found for the first time and will have not played the game yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just make sure they're aware. We'll, yeah, we'll, you'll have to come we'll back in the to episode. That. Yeah, in another year once you're done. <laughs> yeah, they'll just skip. They'll just skip that. Up. That's okay. <laughs> Though I, but, I can answer Daniel's question because my NPC is not much of a spoiler. Uh, anybody who played the demo and then played the main game could probably guess who my favorite NPC is because she shows up in both. Quizzy? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Quizzy's great. She's cool. Quizzy is Quizzy's great. cool. It's, it's like, yeah. she she's the person everybody sees, so it's not as like fun of an answer as some of the deeper cuts, you know, some of mm-hmm. our more hidden away NPCs, but like Part of the reason, like, I used her when we first did the demo and, like, wanted her a little more front and center when we did the main game is I just, I like her. Yeah, she's pretty fun. She's really fun. I, I, I like that she's mildly annoying, including mechanically. I like that. <laughs> I like her hand. I like, there's so much cool about her. Hmm. I'm trying to think. My memory is pretty bad, so I couldn't name a name, but... I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say it's my favorite character, but I'm intrigued with some. Uh, I'm not. I'm not good at talking about this. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember feeling intrigued by. I feel like I'm at the start of like everybody's story of the NPCs. So I, but I feel equally intrigued by all of them. Like there's something, something that grabbed me was like this, this uh, argument between the two about whether or not to get rid of a creature, which I mm-hmm. think was. Mm-hmm. What was the creature again? Well, I don't want to spoil it. Okay, no spoilers. Can't spoil it. But I yeah. that that intrigues me, and I want to know more about the the male character in that situation, mm-hmm. which I've only got a mm-hmm. taste of so far. Yeah. And the female, I can't remember her name, but I like her her vibe too. <laughs> yeah, like a like a parent, I I do I cannot choose favorites. Ah, yeah. the, there are there are some that are my favorites. <laughs> there are. Okay. There, yeah, some that I really enjoyed, like doing ex- some extra writing and characterization for. Um, yeah, that I have I'd love, attachments to. I'd love for us to answer this honestly on our fiftieth. Yeah, and actually, name nice right. plan so, for so it. T- tune back in in the uh, eight Four episodes, months. Daniel. That's right. God, w- God willing, we're all still here. All right. <laughs> do we have a second question from Paul W? We do. Oh. It- yeah, I guess I guess he did ask two questions. Yeah. Well, let's see if this one's worth. No. Today, <laughs> today I came across an expandable card game called Din. Other than looking beautiful, what intrigued me is that the designers have hidden puzzles in each of the cards, or part of a puzzle on each card, to solve a larger puzzle for the full pack. What are your thoughts on including puzzles or Easter eggs in the design of the cards? I think that rules. I'm looking this up right now. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, um when we were at FFG, um Nikki Valens would always do this for each Eldritch Horror expansion. Mm-hmm. Um they'd work with Mark um and uh they would make these different puzzles that the community would then have to and they were they were well, I think one we made too easy by accident, but um, most of them are wickedly hard and the community have to like work together to kind of figure it out. And it would give some hint about a future expansion coming up. 
Didn't um, they figure them out like right away though? That's that's my recollection. Is like, oh yeah, they figured that like it takes like a week or less. It, it, it kind of depends. There was like one that like I forget was it the Egypt expansion that like nobody ever figured out. Yeah. Um, uh, and and like I think that was one of the ones Mark Larson went a little deep on. Um, but <laughs> yeah, there there was there was one or two that people figured out right away. Um, and like sometimes when like pieces of the hints were on cards that got previewed, they'd have like, they'd already get started just from the previews before the game came out. Um, but yeah, it kind of depended. Like it, it is difficult when you have, when you're crowdsourcing stuff to like tune the difficulty, right. For like hundreds of people engaging in the same puzzle all at once. Yeah. Yeah. It, it that sounds really hard. So, so are you four puzzles in like, weird meta puzzles in games it sounds like this one this yeah. din game is kind of like part of the game maybe yeah it kind of looks that way i was looking into it too i mean i like the idea of it being there if you want to to interact with it sort of like what you're saying with the other game but yeah it, i like it's easter just, eggs it's in not, general yeah if it's not clear like we, we we haven't done anything like that uh yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i we're trying Evan to did, like plant Evan a lot of did. seeds in the in the uh, lore. So there's tons of subliminal messages. Evan told me in <laughs> private. He put a lot of weird weird stuff in the clouds and things like uh, that. Okay. So if you can find, start looking. <laughs> a la but, Disney in the '90s. Yeah. To, to answer that that question about like, am I am I in favor of it or not? It really depends on the game. Like, yeah, I think it worked pretty well for Eldritch because it's all about kind of investigation and like pulling clues out of stuff, you know, like um, for the right game, the right vibe. I, I think it's, it's cool, but like mm -hmm. not every game needs it. You know? I'm thinking, I'm thinking of tunic, like the manual in tunic. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was cool. How there's these little, God, I really loved that game. I keep popping into my head. I got to, I, I wonder if it'd be fun to play through again. Now that it's all been revealed. Did you finish it, Andrew? No, no. Yeah. I Fisher, kind of you did. Petered out on it. Yeah, My son I, I, finished I it though. Finish it. it gets wild in the end. It gets really wild. Anyway, I don't want to spoil Tunic. Um, cool. All right. Next, next and final question comes from Superior. If we keep reward cards that we unlocked from campaign to campaign, will each campaign be harder to balance out the power difference between a new character and a character? with access to loads of reward cards or will it be balanced in some other way? The answer to both your questions is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will be harder and yes, it'll be balanced out in some other way. Um, it's so since you're pulling all of you, we've talked about this a bit before, but since you're pulling all your cards from the core set into the expansion, the expansion stuff's more difficult. Um, just straight straight up but we do give tools for people who aren't pulling characters in from the beginning we kind of have a story so far thing that helps kind of you catch up on the story make some key decisions that we need to reference later and then also um potentially gives you a few reward cards there's also a another tool that we won't spoil for kind of helping people catch up and get some cards to kind of balance their decks out a bit that being said, I think people who take that option, their decks will still be a little undertuned compared to people who completed the main plot, the, the main uh, the main story of Lure of the Valley. Um, but one of the other things we're trying to do is like the expansions do are more difficult. You're more practiced at the game at this point. You have some tools, but um, we're not kind of focusing on a linear progression where every expansion is just going to get harder and harder and harder in this very linear fashion um especially as you go into this first expansion the second campaign and then onward you'll see that you're going to start encountering more kind of like differences of kind instead of dif differences in difficulty level and so there'll be kind of new mechanics and new challenges you have and the cards that Ideally, the cards that work well against those challenges will be different. Um, and you'll want to tune your deck to these kind of different challenges. And so 
you won't be necessarily always growing your character by just honing them and making them more powerful, but a lot of your tuning of your deck will be kind of like tuning it to deal with these kind of unique challenges, and then you're on to new different mechanics and you need to tune your deck in a different direction. There'll be a little bit of growth, and like you can definitely, those of you who have unlocked a bunch of reward cards from the core set can see there's just some reward cards that are just good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like, yes, your, your decks will get better, but ideally there's still going to be some tuning. Um, and so it's kind of a, a, a mix. Um, we're doing a little bit of balancing. We're, we're tuning things up a little, like, but by changing it up, I think even players with the really optimized deck will still find interesting things. Mm -hmm. Is my hope, at least. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I think the focus is more on like trying to find new and interesting things to do and ways to experience the game mm -hmm. without necessarily just having this ramp of difficulty because that would just get boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like we don't want you to just play the same terrain sets with all the numbers tuned up. Uh, and you, you'll see there's a... <laughs> there, there, one terrain set uh, I designed a little later in the uh, expansions development uh, um explores interesting difficulty curves that like <laughs> um i i think and like kind of requires you to change up a little bit of how you're playing to properly deal with it and so mm -hmm. I, I think people will enjoy the some of the new experiences we've got very cool thanks for all your questions everybody um that leads us to anders Indie Game Corner. It's, Let's do it. Anders Video Game Indie. Indie Video Game Corner. Um, well, I... Well, first of all, I watched a movie. It's not an indie game. It's called... Uh, it's called Dream Scenario, starring Nicolas Cage. Okay. I would like to, would like to recommend that to people. That was a great movie. Uh, I also saw this movie called Lamb. Have you seen the movie Lamb? No. no. Okay, I'm not even going to expand on either of these. They're just good. <laughs> I like them both. <laughs> They're Lamb good. Go see them. <laughs> Dream Scenario is about this guy played by Nicolas Cage, who's kind of this schlubby professor, kind of uh, doesn't really go for what he wants, and suddenly everybody in the world starts having dreams with him in them, but he's just kind of there. <laughs> he's just like kind of mm. there in the dream, so he kind of becomes this celebrity. And then it goes from there. It's kind of like a being John Malkovich kind of strange. I, I, was, I was just going to say that. I was like, this sounds like <laughs> yeah. John Malkovich. Interesting. Though I, it feels a little I, more real. It feels a little more realistic than those movies. Like it feels okay. like this could actually happen or something. Yeah. Like when you said the name, I Googled it and mm -hmm. like I brought up the movie poster, which is just Nicolas Cage balding, <laughs> raking leaves in like yeah. hacky slacks <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it feels like, like a this movie anders <laughs> it's very much like a 2010 movie it seems okay. to me cool anyway it's cool um but i played i've been, i got obsessed with this free game that just came out called die in the dungeon and uh it's a it's a deck building roguelike which i've been <laughs> very obsessed with this genre lately Mm -hmm. With a fairly and, alliterative name, yet again. Uh -huh, yes. I also have played Cobalt Core more, and I do like that one a lot, too. Um, but anyway, Die in the Dungeon, I became obsessed with. It's free, so you guys should try it out. Um, it's dice rather than cards that you, you build your deck with. So mm. you have attack dice, defense dice, and like boost dice, and various types of dice. And upgrading them, you just get like better numbers on the, the dice and stuff. Uh, I got obsessed with it. I just I think it's really well designed, but the reason I kept putting hours into it is because the final boss is. It's one of those things where like, okay, I figured out the game. I can get to the final boss now. And then you get there, and it's like the boss has two hundred and fifty HP, and it attacks <laughs> you for like all of your health each time. And you're like, how the hell am I ever gonna mm -hmm. beat this guy? And you you keep losing. So. It, there's this element that I really liked of, okay, I actually have to think about, like, what is the optimal deck to go back and beat this boss? And uh, I still haven't beaten him, and it, I hate the fucking game now. 
sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those games. It's one of the, like I, I'll be like, oh, I love this game. It's so cool. And then when I keep just getting almost there, and then it just annihilates me. I'm like, this is so stupid. I hate these designers. What the fuck were they thinking? Uh, that's <laughs> that's the kind of game it is for me. All right, all right. Uh, and I. But then I watch like streamers play it and they beat it on their first try. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'm really bad at these games. Why, yeah. this, this genre that not, I love, I'm very bad at. <laughs> just, just, just don't compare yourself to streamers. For the first, first rule. That's all they do. Like, that's all they do is play games. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, nothing good comes from comparing yourself to streamers. They're like, <laughs> you're going to feel bad about your abilities at games. Okay, okay. Give it a try, though. I, I think it's, I think it's clever. I think it's a, Unique twist on the the genre. If you like that kind of Slay the Spire type game, looks I'm like it's, there's like it was this... also a board game. It was a board game first. No way, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Die in the dungeon. Yeah, from 2020. I, it was six point okay. six on Board Game Geek. Really? Yeah. That is strange. Um, I didn't know that. I'm, I got to look into that. What? Yeah. Why is that a board game? I don't understand. It looks. That. I think it's a different game. No, different game, the, same name. It's got different the game. same graphic. Oh, it doesn't have the same graphics. No, different game, same name. Weird. Okay, okay. Oh, weird. That's interesting. That's unfortunate. What are they going to do about that? <laughs> so there is like a time. So there is. If anyone's interested, I just got to clarify. There's a classic version that's on itch.io, which I also liked, but the new one that I've been playing is on Steam, and it's right. free. Die in the Dungeon Origins. It's free. Check it out. Each run is like. 30 to 40 minutes, I'd say. I'm curious if anybody can beat the final boss. I just want to know if anybody can beat it, because I think it's it's either really well designed or really terribly designed. <laughs> Fisher, I, I would like... I, I would it's either perfect like or awful. You, you, you want opinion. me to try to beat... I, I'm not good at games, Anders. <laughs> well, I, just want, I just want your opinion to think like if it's a fair fair design for the final okay. boss. Cause it's, it's clever. It's a clever design for like a boss in like a deck battler type thing and it's cool it's cool how you put the dice on the board they have to be like a certain number away from each other for them to yeah, synergize i was going to ask you i looked it up and i saw that weird diamond board and i was curious yes so you put your attack die on there and then the boost dice let's say it's a three you can add three to that attack but it has to be three away on the board like oh interesting the, the board's okay. grid so then you can kind of like align so it matters like where you put the dice on the board. It's cool. It's fun. And cute cute graphics too. Um I think that's all I've I've been into games wise. Oh, oh, actually I became obsessed again. I just quickly want to say I became obsessed with uh this older game called Shovel Knight <laughs> King of Cards. I've probably talked about it on this <laughs> show before, but the Shovel Knight uh uh DLC King of Cards. It's like an entirely new game. I think it's like the best Nintendo game that was ever made. It's not a Nintendo game, but it's like everything that Nintendo introduced in terms of like how to design uh fun levels that like introduce new mechanics level to level and then like take them to their fullest potential and then it brings you to the next thing. The writing is funny. It's it's just perfect game. Play the King of Cards. DLC if you never have. And it's so fun to play as this character. He like does this run like shoulder bash thing like Wario Land. I don't know if you guys ever played Wario Land. Oh yeah. So so instead of jumping on enemies, you like charge them and bash them with your shoulder. So your character in King of Cards it bashes against a, an enemy or a wall and then he he hits it and then spins into the air and then he can bounce onto a character an enemy and then he can bash it. he gets one more bash if if you land on an enemy sounds like weirdly over overcomplicated but like when you're playing like the des the design of the levels is like perfect to like accompany that mechanic it's just it's so good i'm probably the only person out here that's like singing the praises of king of cards but it's it's an amazing <laughs> little well, like I, retro I, I was, game I, I was gonna say that i i've actually heard a lot of praise for the shovel knight dlcs because mm. like they they released all these different dlc characters for shovel knight but each one is basically a brand new game. Yes. And like a Especially newly designed one. character and like all new mechanics and all new levels to accommodate them. And I've, I've heard a lot of praise heaped on the Shovel Knight DLCs and I just have never gotten around to playing them. 
and even within this king of cards there's an entire like separate game called joustice which is this tile card game and it has tons of cards with different abilities and like the game is actually very fun to play so that's king of cards that's, that's, of that's most... a good name too joustice <laughs> yeah, yeah joustice yeah yeah i'm intrigued just play the first level i think the first level is just pure fun just give that a try if you got it if you got the game already and i like it much more than the original shovel knight game too it's way more fun hmm. anyway that's my rant uh Oh, also, Anders Indie Game Corner now has a home on Discord under the subtopic of Off Topic. Thank you to D. No, Stid St- Stin Stan Stan Stigeon Plays. <laughs> <laughs> he recommended it, and then D Cheds started it. So, if you nice. want to talk to me about these games that I'm talking about, or any other ones you think I should play, go talk to me there. I turned on notifications for it finally. I'll hear you. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> All right. Uh, Fisher, what have you been into? Uh, well, I don't have a lot of different interesting indie games to recommend at the moment. Uh, in fact, uh, to download Die in the Dungeon, I launched, I opened Steam. Mm-hmm. and uh, Updates? Uh, let's see here. I would say a healthy like 75 percent of my games <laughs> in my list oh, right? installed yeah. games need updates that's how long it's mm-hmm. been since i've opened steam oh, uh, shame on you you've had a child it, though yeah though i i have gotten a little time um one thing i've been doing it's it's super exciting <laughs> not not actually that exciting for those of you on youtube you can see my beautifully magnetized tyranids look at look at look at all of these guys Ooh. on there they're not coming Fantastic. off. Fantastic. So I, I've been magnetizing all of my 40k models so that they stick on these like metal racks. And, oh, like, cool. Because I completely outgrew my storage solution, um, and I needed to kind of refactor it. Um, since we're working on the basement right now, I needed to kind of like get all of the piles of models and deal with them. So I, I finally got kind of started on that. Um, and as a result of doing that, uh. I've had a little time to watch TV for the first time in a while. And I, Sam and I watched uh, Only Murders in the Building, the new season, season three. Um, they, they went that, that far? Can, huh? <laughs> they went to three <laughs> seasons with that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. they're, they're at the third season. E- each season, there's a new murder in their building. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I, I liked, I like, I've, I've liked the show quite a bit. It's, it's yeah, pretty fun. I, I liked what I watched. I watched like the first maybe four episodes and then just kind of fell off it. But I liked it. I, it seemed good. It feels like the kind of show that is safe to watch with my mom. Just like, we'll yes. both <laughs> think this is fine. It's fine. It's pretty good. <laughs> I, I, Keeps I, me interested. I enjoy it quite a bit. The, uh, <laughs> the, the third season gets a little like more out there a bit because it uh, they're like doing a musical and stuff. It gets a little more bombastic. Oh. But okay. um <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, 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 I've, I've been having a good time with it. And then uh, nice. the other thing I've been watching is now that it's finished, I, I told my friends that I wouldn't start a show that's ongoing, especially I won't start an anime that's ongoing because that's how you get stuck watching One Piece for all of time. But uh, <laughs> uh, I started, I, I, it's, it's finished, so I started watching Attack on Titan, um, which long running and finally actually finished after like three attempts to finish their, their final season. Um, Mm -hmm. so I'm just near the end of the first season of that show and, uh, it's been fun. It's the animation's really cool. It it definitely has like, it's a very, uh, accentuated version of like the anime thing, like budget conservation thing where like, you know, you do the like thousand yard stare or like non-moving shots so that you can save budget for like a right. really pretty fight scene so like when you're watching yeah. an episode and nobody's moving at all you know <laughs> there's gonna be a sick fight at the end because like they <laughs> had no budget left yeah um and uh, attack on titan definitely has that it's an interesting contrast to like you know working on rangers because it's it is like a deeply cynical piece of media like in some ways there's like optimism about like with 
well, there's barely any optimism in this setting. It's <laughs> there's like these heroic <laughs> characters who are trying to fight back against these titans, but like how it I think it's trying to portray like the horror of these giant titans coming and attacking the city, but they portray it a lot through showing people, especially soldiers, not being able to deal with it. Mm. And it ends up like coming across as very cynical about humanity and like that, like people kind of default to their basis desires and like cannot deal with the horror that's put in front of them. And only through like the strictures of military command and a few exceptional individuals, can you like keep everything together? Right. And so it's like, like kind of cynical (laughs) about general humanity and also kind of like uh, subtly ma- making this argument for like fascism you know <laughs> like that oh, fascism yeah. works and uh-huh. so like there's the, all this really cool animation and like cool anime action and stuff but then like you start kind of thinking about what it has to say and maybe like i'm still in the first season so i don't know where it goes and maybe mm-hmm. it has like some deeper criticisms of like this kind of fascist society they live in but mm-hmm. right now it kind of feels like fairly cynical and i don't know if i like agree with the general worldview but Mm -hmm. it's but it's also badass at the same time so (laughs) that's what i was gonna say like do you think it's an actual worldview or is it just in service of badass dumb storytelling it's it's interesting i haven't the creator um I, i need to read more to actually feel like i had an educated opinion on it but like one of the things i thought was interesting is the creator is very almost like down on himself like that he doesn't deserve to have made something this popular Mm. um (laughs) uh, so it it was very interesting because like yeah he i part of the reason i was kind of looking into this is just because like trying to figure out yeah like that's how much of this is purposeful statement like you know how much of this is text subtext or unintentional and trying to just kind of figure it out but like one of the interesting things is like he just talks about wanting to have made something cool and like he didn't actually seem to have planned for attack on titan to get as wildly successful as it did um and so i think that seeing his kind of slightly self-effacing discussion does make me kind of look at some of it in a different light like Mm. maybe he wasn't like he wasn't setting out to make this work that had like grand statements to make about how humans should organize themselves he was just right kind of like making this thing that like spoke to him i don't know Mm -hmm. um and like i think reading that interview i can kind of see some of that his views on himself reflected in especially two of the main characters and how they view themselves. And so like, I I'm curious how much is, is like more kind of this like autobiographical exploration, but anyway, I'm, I'm sure people who know more about attack on Titan might, uh, I I've only seen the first season, so I, I'll be able to speak to it more once I've finished it. Mm-hmm. How many seasons are there? I think four. Well, that's not a lot. Hmm. No, by, I'm... by one piece standards, it's over in a blink of an eye. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Pokemon. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Japanese stuff, have have you guys either of you seen the new Miyazaki movie? Are you interested in that? The boy no, and I the heron. The boy and yeah, the I'm, heron. I'm I am academically interested in it. I will totally check it out when it's on streaming. <laughs> on streaming. It's supposed to be great. All right, yeah. Andrew Navarro. Oh, yeah, Andrew Navarro. You your turn. Yes, that's me. Okay. <laughs> Present. Okay. What you got? What'd you do? Uh, I'm finally playing Baldur's Gate 3. The game of the hey. year? Hallelujah. Yep. <laughs> yep. I think I gotta uh, play that. I gotta try it. Yeah, they, uh, I knew that they were going to be announcing the release date for it uh, during the, uh, the Game Award thing. One of the Game Awards things that happened. Um, on Game the Awards. eighth or the yeah. seventh, yeah. Game Awards. And you said it. Given the timing, I was like, I bet they're gonna say it's out right now, and that's exactly what they did. So you, did, you predicted it. Yeah, because it was so late in the year, and they had already said we'll have it done by November. And then it was like the first week of December. I was like, all right, well, it better be now, or else yeah, it's just yeah. not gonna happen. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. So I I got it right before the weekend, and 
I if if my sister in law and her husband were not in town, I probably would have played it for maybe I don't know forty eight hours straight. Wow! <laughs> over the weekend, uh, it's great. This just in: Baldur's Gate three is very good. <laughs> is it? I'm really enjoying for- it. Hot takes and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, here's a here's a quick yeah, layman, awesome. layman's question because it's all it's all been said. Does it play well with a controller? Yeah, it plays pretty well. It it it, it struggles a bit uh, when you're on multiple levels. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think the controllers are the controls super great for that. Sometimes there might be conflicting elements on multiple mm-hmm. levels, so it's trying to get your cursor to the right. Level oh, do you actually do you tough. actually control like a mouse like cursor on the screen? Kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like your little reticle of where your character is going, or like who you want to attack, or what you want to interact with. Yeah. Um, but they built in some pretty good like user friendly things for interacting with stuff in the environment. I think it'd be way better with the mouse and keyboard. Don't get me wrong, but I yeah. not having that, it's not like it's ruining the experience for me or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, For what it's worth, uh, the mouse struggled. At, at least in my time with the game, the mouse struggled with uh, multiple levels as well. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, but yeah, it's. It, I, I described it earlier today as it's having almost a panic-inducing amount of things in it. Uh, Not for there's me. There's so there's so much to encounter. There's so much to see, uh, and it's uh, also talking about earlier today it's, it's like a game where when they're making it no one said no to anything mm. <laughs> they just if when, anytime anyone had an idea they were like yes yes what's, we'll do what's that. like what's the what's like an example of that you've that stood out uh well i think just because you have so many options for everything and there's so many so one, there's just a ridiculous amount of uh, characters you can create. Uh, pretty much everything in the Forgotten Realms you can do, uh, including like sub races. So when I saw that you could make a deep gnome, I was like, well, I gotta make a deep gnome because uh, uh, my wife she played a deep a deep gnome rogue. Uh, in the in the campaign that I DM'd many years ago, so I was like, I'm just gonna, I'll, I feel like I have to make her character fun, yeah. Uh, so I did. So I'm playing as as playing as her old character, and that's been pretty awesome. Cool. Um, so it, just a wealth of character creation options. Uh, but then when you go through the game, just seeing how much of it is tailored to your character's class and your race, um and how many options you have there. And then those options seem to branch based on how you approach individual situations so that it creates new options and then has voice dialogue for everything. And I don't know, they went, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you played the old, uh, telltale, like walking dead game, did you ever play that the the little storytelling kind of choose your own adventure thing? Not All right. Well, you should, you should play that, honors. I think you might like it. Yeah, um, I think you actually might enjoy the Walking Dead games. Uh, okay. But when it came out, it was it uh, it had this really amazing uh, way of creating what felt like a tailored story for you, without mm. actually having a whole lot of branches in it. It was mm. kind of smoke and mirrors. Hmm. but in this game it kind of creates that same feeling as if it's telling a story for you but it really is like (laughs) it's not fake it's there are all seem to be so many ways things can go Hmm. uh where just the amount of work it took writing voice acting animating designing like even Mm -hmm. on the like the interaction side of it, like being able to approach an individual situation so many different ways and having to design it so that you could account for players doing any number of things that don't involve just going in and attacking something. Uh, it's really, a, it's astounding. Um, and then on top of all that, it's a really great uh, simulation of D&D rules, both in and out of combat. But combat is 
super fun and tactical and incredibly mm. enjoyable and deep. It's awesome. Mm. Very good game. Again, it's hot take. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're all different, you know? We're all different. <laughs> and what we like about games, right? Like, I was, I yeah. was getting all worked up about the way the little Shovel Knight guy jumps on the wall, you know? And yeah. It's so yeah. simple to me. That, that thrills me. The idea of just, like, entering a world and having million choices sounds, like, not fun to me yeah <laughs> you know like it's yeah di- i can see it's that a, but i but i always i know that the right thing that just the right thing can grab me so i'm still curious like w- would this be one of those things well grab, it's the thing where me? i just playing it i, I just Im- imagined i didn't have to imagine too much um because my son's fashion he saw me playing he's like well that looks cool i want to try it hmm he doesn't know D and D as well as I do. You know, I've you know been playing D and D on and off for you know a good m- amount of my life, mm-hmm. uh, and it was really interesting seeing him come in and try to play and watching him like bang his head against the wall and these this combat like kind of there's an early combat challenge that you encounter that is like the first real challenge that you get, mm-hmm. and just watching him get defeated over and over and over again where like whereas the first time i went through it it was kind of dicey for a minute but you know i got through it on my first try mm-hmm. uh if you come in with no D knowledge whatsoever or how those rules work like the game doesn't teach you much of anything <laughs> really it just kind of like pushes you off the deep end it's like ah you know you'll figure it out hmm. and i think either you will bounce off of that uh or you'll embrace it um and it, yeah. it's fine with that hmm. yeah I, like, I i i will say i don't think Baldur's gate is for you anders <laughs> mm, okay yeah that's my guess but there's uh, lots of jumping yeah. you can jump a lot i like to jump in games you if can there's no jump ju- there's some pretty good jumping <laughs> <laughs> i'm in i i think there's also one of the other interesting things that you can do in it is you can find all sorts of weird workarounds to things like there's a lot there's almost a like emergent sims like a a thief or like a deus ex or bioshock those kind of like emergent sim games where there's just systems and you can use them to solve problems in ways that developers maybe didn't expect mm-hmm. there's some of that that i think you would actually enjoy anders mm-hmm. but there's so much other stuff to get there that i'm not sure i i think to 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 your response to Andrew saying there's like a panic inducing amount of stuff to do. I <laughs> I, I don't know if you yeah. enjoy it as much as some of these yeah. smaller games. Do you like menus? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. I, there's I'm a lot honing... of menus. I spent a lot of time in menus. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I it's one of those things, like I really there are certain things that other people love that I really want to love too. That's one of them is these bigger bigger triple a games like this and i don't know i think i need like this immediate feedback like a simple like i think i like video games that feel more like a a simple game in the real world such as playing catch you know there's just like a input (laughs) and a feedback and then you Uh can like put tweaks on that that make it even more fun such as the way this king of cards guy jumps around it's a whole different thing like Baldur's gate it's a whole different type of game it is it's it's yeah. accessing a whole different part of your brain that's not so close to like playing a, a physical game do you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. that's that's my philosophy that's my theory yeah. on what what i'm drawn to though also, you know like go ahead you don't have to feel bad for not liking big triple a games anders if but anything, i want to they look your so cool. taste in game is <laughs> your taste in games is cooler than our taste in games like you're <laughs> the cool hipster of this well, podcast you know <laughs> i don't want to be I the will... cool hipster anymore i'm gonna be the <laughs> too bad dork <laughs> i will say that like i think Baldur's gate is interesting because it's it it broke through to the mainstream in a way that, that I don't think they were really anticipating. Yeah. Um, but it's a it's a niche game. Like right. it is Even that like, the... like old school, like it's it's a new it's a new take on the old school RPG model, which was also a niche. Right. You know, it's it's not I would not classify it as a as a 
big triple a blockbuster it just kind of became one somehow did yeah uh, it's not like god of war that i would yeah you, i would mm. or like a call of duty yeah you don't want like, to put right, it right. in the same category as an ubisoft game <laughs> it's no, just not no. yeah it's yeah. not you wouldn't you wouldn't be like hey what's a game we're gonna make that's gonna make us like billions of dollars mm-hmm. well let me tell you about this game that's gonna take us like <laughs> six years to develop and it's like the uh, third it's like spend... the third in a franchise that most people haven't heard of <laughs> i think Gate most three. people have heard of it yeah Baldur's Baldur's most people have heard of it i never heard of it yeah, till like it's... last year yeah okay well it's different See, there you go different niche. bubbles it's a niche. Diff- it That's is right. yeah I, I may get it on steam with the intent of returning it just to like try it just to see you know i'm very i'm curious i don't know i don't know if you're you might not get through character creation in the two hour <laughs> steam return window <laughs> oh yeah i, I got through it pretty fast i i like I'll just, if you I'll go in it. with I'll an idea fast. you just go yeah just, you, you can't there's not a lot of like uh that's one my one gripe there wasn't a lot of uh facial stuff for face stuff it's like there's a lot of presets you got to combine oh i see but you couldn't actually like control chin and jaw and eyes and i will you say can go that full monster factory on it yeah I, or you know try to make it i wanted to do like i didn't and this that was my one gripe on the on the gnomes i didn't wasn't quite super satisfied with the faces i had mm. to settle mm. i had to settle <laughs> I will say that one of my biggest red flags in games that immediately turn me off is when you boot up the game, you're excited to play the game, and then it's there's that guy standing there waiting for you to choose his face and his fucking pants. That's not fun to me. <laughs> okay, well, then this game is definitely not for you. I have bad news about Baldur's Gate, Anders. I, I, just, want to go, I just want to start jumping right away. Let's jump. <laughs> yeah, like I, my thought is like, when can I find a, a when can I find a vendor in the game to change the clothes that I wear in my camp? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I really want better clothes. Yeah, so I do. Yeah. I want to dress up my character. Uh huh. <laughs> I will try it someday. Okay, can I borrow yours? Can't do that anymore. Nope. No. Nope. Um. All right, guys. Good talk. Good show. Thanks everybody for joining us. Send us our questions, yada, yada, yada. We'll see you next time. Right here on Earthborn Games Podcast. (laughs) Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye.